Thank you all for coming. Um, we might just start with prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Charles, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming. And um, you know, this is something that we would we started it probably I think it was a couple of years ago. It's something that we want to keep growing and it's good to see new faces and it's good to see, you know, even like numbers like this um, come to these talks. We're hoping to do it once a term. Like that's it's something that's you know we can all commit to and it's hoping to you know get our community and our fathers together to get us a little bit active for our kids for this community and um we we're just talking earlier like you know this is something that's growing all these men's talks you know not just here at other parishes as well and with all the craziness and all the rubbish that's going around you know i think this is you know very necessary and so the more that we can support this and you know get together the more that you know we can you know work towards good change good holy change tonight we've got um dr robert Hatter, who is a parent who is a former teacher and he's always a teacher and you know a long-standing you know member of this parish and he doesn't really need any introduction everyone knows him so we'll hand him you know this uh, this talk tonight and obviously the topics on saint joseph the head of the holy family so welcome robert thank you thanks father it's always a, a great pleasure and an honor to come back to st charles in any way shape or form um and uh just after a great holy week in this parish uh, i was just so impressed about how things are growing the numbers of people the activity the events etc and it's very very exciting and as father said it is true there i've noticed in the last five to six years a surge in activity for men uh, men's groups men's rosaries public talks barbecues etc etc in the Maronite community, in the Roman Catholic community, particularly the Croats, etc., And this is definitely a work, a movement of the Holy Spirit. And as the Father said, I've been in this parish for more than 50 years. They're celebrating the 50th anniversary this year on Christmas Eve, 1974. That's the anniversary of the opening, the first mass in this current church. But before that, the, that main altar in the church now was in a lounge room in a house on the same site. And I lived around the corner and my parents would bring me here to this parish somewhere in early 1973. I've seen the growth in this parish and I've seen the momentum, especially in the last 20 years. It's phenomenal and we need to keep it going. There is a reaction against what is happening in the world. The nonsense, you can we sum it up with the term woke now, but I think people have had enough because it's against nature. It's against God, it's against our faith, it's against nature, and people are drawing a line under it. And that takes courage. And this talk also involves courage. The very title, St. Joseph, Head of the Holy Family, is controversial. The concept of a man, male, husband, father being the head of the family has been under under attack for decades and most of the western world has swallowed has surrendered to this attack the idea of saying that the man is the head of the family is anathema to today's culture radical feminism has triumphed in the minds the vast majority of most people not just women but also men in the western world and this has resulted in men being muted and disempowered. We've got to recover it. And we have to have the, the courage and the determination to recover it, but in the right way. We can't just say to ourselves, 
Okay, we're the man, we're the, I'm, the, I'm the husband, I'm the dad, I'm in charge, end of the story. We're tempted to say that and talk like that at times, but we need to restore the headship of the man, of the husband, of the father, as understood in Scripture, as modelled by Jesus Christ, as modelled by St. Joseph, as spoken about by St. Paul. This is how St. Paul talks about the headship of the male. It's a famous passage, it's in Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 25. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Oh, that's anathema, that's anathema. Okay. <laughs> submit yourself to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. In everything, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, the term submission, submit, is a hard term. It sounds oppressive. It sounds toxic. And it can easily lead to oppression and, and be toxic. But the, the remedy for that is in that same verse that I just read, the last, the end part of it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? We see it on the cross. He gave his life for the church. That is for, for the Jews at that time and for the whole world who did not yet know him, did not yet believe in him and even did not yet exist. He gave his life up on the cross as a sacrifice to God the Father for really the sake of the whole world. That is the model that St. Paul's talking about that, that he is offering to men the model of leadership of Men of their wives, of their families, of their children. It is a unselfish, sacrificial, unconditional love. The Greek word for it is agape, agape love. And I stand here in front of you saying, I'm glad I'm giving this talk because I have to remind myself about this. That's, people say, well, how, you know, I'm glad I give talks sometimes because I have to remind myself of where I'm heading, what I'm doing and what I'm not doing right. To talk about agape love, unselfish, sacrificial, self-giving love, the love that Christ showed on the cross, it's easy to do that. It's easy to talk that. It is much, much harder to practice that, to live that. Because it's denying ourselves. One of the great wounds of original sin is excessive self-love. And that hampers our love of God and our love of our neighbour and love of others. And this is what Christ came to remedy. To, our love has become inverted because of original sin. Loving ourselves above all things. And Christ came to teach us how, the, how, how our love is to be extroverted, to beam out of us, to shine out of us towards others. This only can be achieved through the grace of God. Naturally, by ourselves, we tend to selfishness and also abuse of power. When we read about original sin in the book of Genesis and we read in chapter 3 some of the punishments that flowed as a consequence of the disobedience in the garden one of them one punishment was specific upon Eve well, a number of them were in relation to Eve specific she would be under the oppression of her husband we have to distinguish between dominion and domination. I'm here saying that the man does have dominion, but that can't be expressed as domination. 
there's a subtle difference here. Some would say not really, but what I'm saying is that our dominion must be expressed in, as love that's unselfish, sacrificial, and self-giving. That's the different. That's different from a domination that oppresses, right? That disempowers the other, that disrespects the other, that tramples upon the other. All right. As I said, this is very hard. The one reason the weapon that radical feminism used to triumph was to point to the abuse of power that men engaged in. It wasn't that long ago, go back 150 years ago, that in the Western world, which was much more Christian then than it is now, women were basically chattels. I'm not talking about black women being slaves in the southern states of the United States. I'm talking about women generally did not have legal capacity to enter into contracts, did not have the right to vote, could not inherit, things like that. That was an abuse of male dominion. And that abuse gave rise to a feminist movement which had at, at first legitimate claims, legitimate grievances, but then that got out of control. But when we abuse our power, when we abuse our dominion to dominate, to despoil, to dispossess, right, that works against us. Because that's the excuse to overthrow male dominion entirely. And that's where we are now. That's what's essentially happened. Now, the talk is about St. Joseph, head of the Holy Family, as a model for us and our family. So what do we know about St. Joseph generally? Well, not much. What he is, though, what we can draw from the little material we have in the Gospels is that he was a king. He was a, in the line of the house of David, the legitimate kingly line, which was disempowered, no longer in power, and hadn't been in power since the Babylonians came and destroyed Judah in 586 BC. And they sent the Davidic kings um, and, and, the, and the heirs, Zedekiah, they blinded him and sent him into captivity in Babylon. They killed his sons. They sent Jehoiakim, the nephew of Zedekiah, into exile in Babylon. And the house of David for all intents and purposes, seemed to have disappeared. And this was of utmost importance, not just to the Jews and Judah as a whole, but to the plan of salvation that God was rolling out. Because the Messiah had to be a member of the house of David. But if the house of David is dispossessed, disempowered, and, and had, for all intents and purposes disappeared, then how is the Messiah going to come into the world? Well, it still existed. And it existed through both St. Joseph and Our Lady. But now they're up there in Nazareth and insignificant. But Joseph was of that house, that line. But he was a king, but not sitting on a throne. Matthew 1.16 also mentions that Joseph was the son of Jacob. But Luke 3.23 calls him the son of Heli. What's going on here? This is important for this reason. For people who are Islamic apologists against Christianity, they're always looking for errors in Christian scripture. And I've got a next student of mine who always sends me Islamic attacks. Robert, can you answer these? And sometimes I go, oh no, I haven't got time for this, but I've got to do it. How can you answer this? Matthew says that Joseph is the son of Jacob. As the Old Testament figure, Joseph of the house of the coat of many colours, was a son of Jacob. But Luke says he's the son of Heli. Can anyone answer that contradiction? We can't. We're shaking our heads. So let's go off to the mosque now. Right? Maybe they're right. Maybe the Quran is the only true written word of God. Okay, here's the answer. There is an answer. But it's based in Jewish law. They are both the father. They are both fathers of St. Joseph, but in different ways. Now, one of them, we don't know who, was the biological father of St. Joseph. 
The other one was the legal father under the Leverite law. So, I hope I don't lose you here. So that's my role to explain this and keep it simple. St. Joseph had a natural mother and father before he was conceived and born. That first husband of St. Joseph's mother died. And under the Leverite law, the next brother in line had to step up and marry the widow and give and bear children in the name of his dead older brother. So this is what happened here. I don't know who's the biological and who's the legal, but let's say for the sake of the argument, Jacob was married to St. Joseph's future mother. Jacob died. Heli married St. Joseph's mother and began to have children, but under the name of Jacob. So Matthew is giving us a genealogy of St. Joseph through his legal father. And Luke is giving us a genealogy of St. Joseph through the biological father. And when we look at the two genealogies in Matthew and Luke, they are different. The descendants of Jesus are different. Why? Because the two brothers, Jacob and Heli, of course had the same mother, but they had different fathers. The mother had been married twice. So that's why the genealogies go back differently. Okay, that's the answer. And that answer was worked out in the third century. We've got a church father, um, Julius Africanus. Uh, he wrote about this. He gave us the explanation. St. Augustine accepted that explanation and we, we, we go from there. But most people, including myself, I didn't know about this for decades. I just recently came across it in the last, say, three or four years. So that's, what, that's the explanation for that. So I'm not going to any mosque at the moment. I'm happily staying here. All right. Matthew 1.18 calls St. Joseph a, the, a righteous man, a just man. By the way, St. Mark's Gospel doesn't even mention him. Because St. Mark starts with an adult John the Baptist and an adult Jesus. So there's no Joseph at all. Because by the time Jesus begins his public ministry, St. Joseph is long gone out of the picture. We don't know exactly when. The only thing I've read, the Catholic Encyclopedia, of 1911. I have a copy of it at home. It's, it's, it's a magnificent work. It says that he died around the year AD 17. They don't give any explanation as to why or where the source is for that. But if that's the case, then St. Joseph died when Jesus was about 19, 20 years of age. And that's okay for Jesus because under Jewish law, even now, the boy becomes a man when he's 13 and he goes through his bar mitzvah. He becomes a son of the commandment. Okay, now what job does St. Joseph do? He was a carpenter. And the only place that mentions that Jesus was also a carpenter was in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 3. And the word used is tekton in Greek. So, and Tecton was more than a carpenter. So what St. Joseph was doing, he wasn't just working with wood. Right? We get the word technology in English, which from the two Greek words, Tecton and Logos, knowledge, understanding of how to make things. Oops. So Tecton, yeah, work with wood, made, worked also with stone, work with metal, made things and repaired things. So St. Joseph was the local go-to man for furniture, for, uh, for tools, for repairs, etc., etc. And I'm sure our Lord Jesus working with St. Joseph made some wonderful things. And I like to write a kid's book one day called The Jesus Table. It's about a table that uh, Jesus and maybe Joseph together made that's continued on through all the generations for 2,000 years and it's sitting in someone's house and they don't even know who made it. But wherever it's gone for 2,000 years, it's brought great blessings to whatever home it's been you know, sitting in. All right, now, 
St. Joseph also, okay, he's not mentioned in Mark's gospel, but in all the, in the other two gospels, Matthew and Luke, he's not recorded as saying anything, not a word. So he's the unknown king and the silent saint. Not a word comes from his mouth. I'm sure there were many words that came from his mouth, but not one is recorded in any of the Gospels. And that's why many good women love St. Joseph, the model husband who never says anything. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, St. Joseph has many formal titles in the church. And on the 8th of December, 1870, Pope Blessed Pius IX named St. Joseph Patron of the Universal Church. Formal title given at the top by the Pope. The Pope said at the time, most troublesome times, this is 1870, beset by enemies on every side and weighed down by calamities so heavy that ungodly men assert that the gates of hell have at length prevailed against her. And, and we beseech his intercession in times of trouble. Pius IX, 1870, times of trouble. Now, very bad times. This is when the papal states, would, which the church had held for over a thousand years since Charlemagne's time, were stripped, ripped off the church and incorporated into the new Republic of Italy. Not, and the Pope was then left as a prisoner in the Vatican, probably until, yeah, for 50 years plus, until they negotiated a concord out with Mussolini in the 1920s, 1929 thereabouts, etc. Okay, now when you read those words of Pius IX, my response is, well, there's nothing new under the sun. Because our times are even more calamitous now than they were, uh, what's that, 150 odd years ago. So St. Joseph remains for us and must be continually invoked by us as, a, as the patron of the Universal Church in these more darker times. St. Joseph, though, has always been, even long before 1870, has always been de facto, in reality, in fact, a protector of the church. And how? The domestic church. Jesus, Mary and Joseph were the domestic church. And St. Joseph was given, was made the patron, the one responsible for protecting that church. How did St. Joseph protect the Holy Family as head of that family? He overcame his fear and did as the angel told him and took Mary as his wife. Matthew 1, 19 to 25. So he, for us as men, we are sometimes fearful of a situation. St. Joseph was very fearful, probably also angry. He felt betrayed. And then when he realized he wasn't betrayed, he was still fearful because this was a mystery that was probably at first beyond him. Some of the Greek fathers comment on this, this aspect. And imagine us in that situation. Your fiancé is now pregnant. You're angry. You're going to divorce her quietly. You could have a stone to death. St. Joseph had that legal right. But, he, but then the angel revealed the truth. But it would have been still very difficult for him to grapple, to cope with, to accept. Now, this is a huge responsibility now. This woman is extra, ultra special. Unique, none other like her, conceived by the Holy Spirit, this child. Then St. Joseph accompanied Mary on the long journey, at least four days via Bat Shatton, from Nazareth to Ein Karim to visit and assist her cousin, said Elizabeth and Zachariah, because we know that she was already six months in advance. Now, I've traveled through this part of the world. It's about 140 kilometers. The route they took from Nazareth heading south east to Bat Shetan, and then down the eastern side of the Jordan River, then to where Jericho is, and then come inland from Jericho. That's about a 140 kilometer journey. That's a pretty easy journey today in the bus or the car, on a donkey. At least four days, could have been seven. 
overnight outdoors, it was dangerous. St. Joseph had responsibility to look after Mary, the pregnant Mary, at, in this time. And again, to repeat the same journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem in obedience to the decree of Augustus Caesar. <clears throat> And then trying to find accommodation in Bethlehem and being there to attend at the birth of Jesus. These were long journeys, these were dangerous journeys and only St. Joseph knew what was really going on. And he had that great responsibility. He had enormous responsibility uh, to protect the Holy Family as this silent vessel uh, elected vessel to uh, is part of God's plan of redemption for, for humanity. And by the way, attending the birth of Jesus, I want to make a comment here, which is a little bit of, of a tangent. We get the birth of Jesus mentioned, of course, in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel. And they're, they're different, but you, we could combine them together as one narrative. There's one prophecy in Isaiah that we know very well. Isaiah 11, 7, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. And Luke, Matthew takes that, the Greek version of that text and embeds it in his gospel. And Emmanuel means God among us. But there's another prophecy in Isaiah at the end, chapter 66, 7, that's relatively unknown. And it goes as follows. Before she had labor pains she gave birth to a male child who has heard of such a thing now that's that's a prophecy relating to the birth of christ it was miraculous saint joseph and the virgin mary of course they're the only ones there saint joseph is witnessing this miraculous birth so mary is a virgin before and after the birth of christ but also in giving birth to Christ, she remains a virgin because the church teaches that the birth of Christ was miraculous. He comes forth from the ver Our Lady's womb without breaking her hymen, without making her lose her virginity. Now, people scoff at that today. People laugh at that today. Critical scholars of scripture pour scorn on that today. I just read the other day about, there's a lot of Protestant activity about, you know, um, the third temple is about to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Get ready. The red heifers have come from America. All that. Who's heard of this stuff? Anyone heard of this stuff? Yeah. yeah. It's another talk, but to summarize it, it is nonsense. And I came across one Protestant commentary on this Isaiah 66, 7, saying that this passage that I just read, you know, um, you know, uh, a woman shall give birth to a male child before she has any labor pains is a prophecy relating to the restoration of Israel in 1947, etc., etc., leading ultimately to the re rebuilding of the third temple. Complete nonsense. With all respect, complete nonsense. It's a prophecy relating to the miraculous birth of the Messiah. I, Isaiah has over a dozen very clear prophecies relating to the coming of Jesus. That's why we call Isaiah, in a sense, the fifth gospel. Okay? We can talk about more about this um, restoration of the temple in an, another time. But I can just say it's not going to happen. If it is going to happen, it's a prelude to the coming of the Antichrist. But the third temple is in this room now. It's us. It's that when you're in a state of grace... You are filled with the Holy Spirit. St. Paul says at 1 Corinthians 6, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And the high priest comes into that temple, which is filled with the Spirit of God. The high priest is to go into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, where the Spirit of God was present. That's all gone. He the high priest comes into our temple filled with the Holy Spirit and we receive him in Holy Communion. That's what has replaced it. That's the third temple, us. The high priest is Christ. The presence of God in the world is in us when we're in a state of grace. All right, I'll get back on topic now. All right. St. Joseph also fulfilled the law in the, regarding the circumcision of Jesus after eight days and the presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple at 40 days. So he was 
observant of the law, faithful in that regard. It's very important for leadership. I'll just throw this point in now before I forget because I, it's not in my text. Our role as fathers, if we practice the faith with integrity, there's a 90% plus chance your children will pick up and practice the faith. 90% plus. But if we don't practice the faith, only our wives do, only the mothers do, it's a fact that number drops to 17%. That's how important our role is. That's why the Western world is dying, because the dads are absent. And even if they are present, they're not modeling, they're not seeing, they're not praying in the home, they're not on their knees, they're not going to mass. Your boys, if you've got boys, are going to imitate you. If you're practicing, they're going to think it's a manly thing, and they'll do it. If it's only the mother's practicing, oh, good honor. That's nice, but I'm not doing it because I don't want to be seen as a, some type of wimpy kid. Okay? That's how critical our role is. So it's evident there, St. Joseph's obeying the law, he was faithful as a husband and as a father. Still in Bethlehem, receiving the Magi from the east, taking care of the precious gifts on behalf of the Holy Family. So gold, frankincense and myrrh. We don't know how much gold was there, but it was important. They're going to live off that gold. We don't realize it. They're going to escape to Egypt. It's not going to be easy to survive there. St. Joseph had to be a good custodian of the finances of the family. I'm sure he wasn't gambling and getting drunk and wasting the money, etc. He was responsible. St. Joseph, heeding the warning of the angel Gabriel to flee to Egypt in the face of the threat from Herod the Great, the difficult journey from Bethlehem to Alexandria, and protecting the Holy Family while in Alexandria. Again, these are very scary times. Imagine you, someone's coming after your family. Someone's coming to kill your children. And you get a knock at the door from the good neighbor. Hey, get up and go now to save your family. This is what St. Joseph gets. The angel appears to him in a dream, tells him to get up and go. He's obedient. He's faithful, he's obedient, and he's willing to sacrifice his own comfort for the safety of his family. And going from Bethlehem to Alexandria in Egypt, you're crossing the Sinai Desert on the back of a donkey. He had to do it instantly without any notice. And that's very hard, that's very long, and it's very dangerous. And Alexandria, Egypt's pagan territory. Egypt represents exile, represents sin. If they're worshiping all sorts of God, Alexandria was a Greek city after Alexander the Great. The Ptolemies were Greek, Greek uh, pharaohs of Egypt that from the from the king from the general Ptolemy, one of the four generals of Alexander the Great. Uh, so it was worshiping all sorts of false gods and idols. And but there would have been a Jewish community in Alexandria. No doubt about it. That's why in the, what was it, 3rd century BC, they commissioned the writing of a Greek Old Testament, translating it from the Hebrew to the Greek, why a vernacular for the Jews outside of Palestine. It wasn't Palestine, so it was not called Palestine until the 1st century AD. So you can't call it Palestine in the 3rd century BC. From out of the, <coughs> would, have, would have been a, a province in the third century BC, it was uh, under the rule of the Egyptians before it went to the rule of the uh, of the Seleucids in the north. So anyway, we have a Greek Bible for the Jews outside of the Holy Land, and that became the Greek that became the Old Testament version for the apostles. By the way, when they're writing the Gospels in Greek, they're getting the Old Testament quotes from the Greek Old Old Testament that was produced for the Jews in Alexandria, in Egypt, and that's where the Holy Family went. So there was some consolation for the Holy Family. They would have settled in the city and there would have been other Jews around them and synagogues, etc. But in the midst of a generally pagan culture, very, very pagan culture. <clears throat> then St. Joseph, waiting patiently in Egypt without question, not knowing how long they're going to be there, until the angel told him it was safe to go back 
to the Holy Land. Matthew 2, verses 13 to 23. But when they got back to Bethlehem, what did they find out? Yeah, Herod the Great, the monster's dead, but he's succeeded by one of his sons, Archelaus, who's also a monster. Okay? And so he had to make another decision to travel back north again to Nazareth, and that's in Matthew 2, 22 to 23. Now, these, now what follows now are the silent years. The silent years of the whole Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So we can only imagine there, up there in Nazareth, St. Joseph is just working away, doing what he has to do, appearing for all intents and purposes to be a normal dad with a normal family and, and, look, and doing what is called upon the everyday ordinary. And when someone asks me how things are going, and I say, they're going well, you know, everything's normal. Normal is good. Normal is very good. Okay? Appreciate the normal. And here now, St. Joseph, Our Lady, the Christ child, they're appearing normal for, in, for the, in the eyes of the rest of the world around them. And St. Joseph is just fulfilling his obligations. Right? We know that St. Joseph treats Jesus as his own son. And this is a sacrifice. You know, some people are, are very good at adopting children, taking them as their own, you know, and looking after them and raising them as their own. Some people can't do it. I'm not judging them. I've got a very good friend of mine, very good Catholic, um, and he's, he, him and his wife have never been able to have children, but he, he just can't, you know, can fathom the idea of adopting children, for example, while other people can. So St. Joseph is making more everyday sacrifices to support the Christ child uh, as his own and portray him to the rest of the world as his own because we know from Luke 4 22 that everyone is saying is not people are saying is not this the son of Joseph okay so St. Joseph played the role well as a foster father of Jesus and doing what was normal all the obligations of a father towards the Christ child St. Joseph along with Our Lady searched with great anxiety for three days for him Luke 2, 48. And this is the last mention we have of St. Joseph. The last mention. That, that would have been a very difficult 48 hours plus. You know, uh, did the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph sin in losing Jesus? I mean, how could they lose Jesus? What's going on? So I've had this put to me. Uh, people say, oh, Mary was a sinner. You know, show me, where, where was Mary a sinner? Oh, I had, losing Jesus for three days. I mean, get real. What type of negligent parent was she and therefore St. Joseph, negligent parent? They weren't being negligent. You don't impose Western models on the Eastern, Mid Middle Eastern cultures of that time. When they came down from Nazareth to Jerusalem, right, and men were meant to do that three times a year, for Pentecost, Tabernacles and Passover, and all, ma all males with a certain radius of Jerusalem, it was compulsory, and that included Jesus, who's now 12, becoming 13. And St. Joseph was faithful to that, as I've said, a faithful observer of the law. Um, and then women, it was optional to come, so Our Lady came. But they travelled as a, as a village. They travelled as an extended family. They weren't traveling as individuals or even um, a nuclear family. They came down as a village. So, you know, the, some commentators say the men were there and the women were there and the kids were somewhere in the middle. And when they went back, they traveled the same way. So that's, uh, Our Lady in St. Joseph just thought that Jesus is with the other kids. It's not negligence. It was the customs, the cultures, how they operate. And at the end of that first day, when they stopped for, to camp, Jesus wasn't there, and they began to ask the question. And then they spent this next day returning. It would have been very traumatic. You know, we're all, if we're parents, we know how traumatic that would have been. I mean, imagine you're thinking, oh no, I've dropped this ball. I've, dropped, I've lost the Son of God. Like, you know, I'm supposed to be the... Actually, all these thoughts would have gone through their head. And the third day, they found them in the temple eventually. All right. That's the last thing we have of St. Joseph. Not nothing else. St. Joseph is not there at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Our Lady's there. And the brothers and sisters of Jesus are there. They're his cousins. By the way, the brothers and sisters of Jesus, as mentioned in 
uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 54, etc. James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. The girls aren't mentioned by name. They are the first cousins of Jesus. How? We know not from Scripture. We can put it together from Scripture. Right? But from the historian Hegesippus, who writes around AD 140, says that Alphaeus was the brother of St. Joseph. And then he says that Alphaeus, his sons were James, Joseph, Jude and Simon. Two of them were apostles. James the Less and Jude Thaddeus were children of Alphaeus married to Mary. Alphaeus the brother of St. Joseph. So two apostles, again, James the Less and Jude Thaddeus, were first cousins of Jesus. On the other side, Salome married to Zebedee. There's a tradition there that tells us that she's the sister of Our Lady. And that her sons, the sons of Zebedee, James the Great and, and um, John, they're, they're first cousins of Jesus as well on Mary's side. So when Jesus is choosing his disciples, four of them are blood first cousins. Two on the dad's side, St. Joseph, the foster father, father, two on his mother's side, the Virgin Mary. So it's all family in a sense, isn't it? Okay, well, part of it is family. All right, now where do we get up to? All right. And, so, and Jesus, so St. Joseph is not there at the crucifixion, not there at all mentioned. What do we say? What can we say? Well, as I said, the Catholic Encyclopedia says he dies when Jesus is around 19, 20 years of age. No, no supporting data for that. Um, but anyway, we can say something about his death in a few minutes. In the ninth century, an early title used to honour St. Joseph was the Nutritor Domini, meaning the guardian of the Lord. As a protector of the Holy Family, St. Joseph displayed the following virtues, obedience, courage, prudence. So all that, what I just listed in the last 15, 20 minutes is summed up as the virtues of obedience, courage, and prudence. Nowhere do we hear or read anything about St. Joseph in these very troubling times as someone who is disobedient, cowardly, or imprudent, or reckless. Now, St. Joseph remains the protector, the, the protector of the Holy Family of the Church through the following. Now, this is what the Church has bestowed upon St. Joseph. He's now, we know he's the patron of the Universal Church. So he's a father, <coughs> intercessor for the Universal Church. He's a patron of a happy and holy death. Why? We don't know any details about his death, but he didn't die alone. Who would have been at his bedside? Our Lord and Our Lady, one, one side and the other. You can't get a happier death than that. You can't be better prepared for death than that. All right? Someone asked me a question the other day. Was St. Joseph's body assumed into heaven? That's not a dogma like the Assumption of Our Lady. I wouldn't even say it's a doctrine. I wouldn't even say it's, it's teaching. But there are opinions. I don't subscribe to it, but there's a theologian from the 15th century, John Gerson, who advocated for it. St. Jerome believed that he was buried in a cave. St. Jerome spent his last years in Bethlehem. And you can see, you can go visit that cave today. And that St. Joseph was buried in a tomb that by the time of St. Jerome's time, which is the early 5th century AD, that tomb was now empty. That's all we know from St. Jerome. St. Joseph is also the patron saint of craftsmen, engineers and workers, patron saint of unborn children, expected mothers, fathers, family, and strangely, house sellers and buyers. Right? So if you're at an auction and you want to win a house, you invoke St. Joseph. You know. Okay, it's very hard to win an auction today. You know, one reason why houses are so expensive among, among many reasons I'm diverting again. I once attended a talk maybe 20 years ago by a professor in economics who explained that house prices began to go berserk from the early 70s onwards. 
and they're gone incredibly berserk in our modern, in our present time. And he said, it, it's down to artificial contraception. I'm thinking, well, how's that? You don't get the economists saying that today in the public, right? But when artificial contraception became widespread in its use, then the birth rates began to drop. By 1973, the birth rate in Europe hit negative levels. So the number of children being born were not replacing, were below replacement level, 2.2 children per family keeps the population stable. But in 1973 and ever since, it's been below 2.2. When a woman is on contraception regularly, she has fewer children and therefore fewer years when she's out of the workforce. The more years that a family has two people in the workforce, the more cashed up they are. The more cashed up they are, the more they can bid prices up at auctions. And that's what's been driving the health. One reason, among many, there are other factors, economic factors, and we know some of the factors today have got nothing to do with contraception at all, but it's been a contributing factor. Because families became wealthier because women and families were having less children and more time in the workplace, more double income time. All right, okay, back on topic. Patron saint of unborn children, expectant mothers. Oh, we said that. St. Joseph is also a patron saint of the Americas, Canada, China, Croatia, Mexico, Korea, Austria, Belgium, Peru, the Philippines, and Vietnam. By the way, who knows Australia's patron saints? Our Lady Help of Christians. St. Francis Xavier as a missionary saint. And St. Therese of the Infant Jesus. Because she prayed for missionaries. You remember Australia was a missionary country, was and is again a missionary country. And St. Mary MacKillop, of course, is, is now uh, the only if local canonised saints from Australia so far. All right. First uh, of May, the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, established by Pius XII in 1955. Why do you think? First um, of May, what day is that? What Around the world, what is celebrated on the 1st of May? Labor Day, May Day. It's a big feast. It's the Christmas of the communists, right? And they offered a, a false solution to economic problems, exploitation, injustices, etc. right? There were many injustices, economic exploitation, abuses, etc. but communism was not the real solution. So the Pope at the time, Pius XII, as, as a prayerful weapon, uh, made St. Joseph the patron of workers as the real model and solution um, against communism. In 1955, communism was a very, very powerful uh, and threat to the world, but it's even worse now because they got smarter. Communism and its errors have now conquered in the Western world without firing a shot. They won not through tanks and bullets and guns and weapons. They, they, they changed the culture. They conquered the culture through the media, through the movies, through the music, and now the social media. And all the errors that Our Lady warned us against or about at Our Lady of Fatima in 1917, they tried one way to spread those errors for 70 odd years. That fell apart, but it's much, they've been much more successful in the last 30 odd years. And they were very successful beforehand, but even more successful now by spreading those errors and permeating the entire culture. Okay, how do we imitate St. Joseph's virtues and headship in our own lives? St. Joseph had a desire for a holy marriage. And we need to have the same desire. I'll give you a very scary statistic. Work at promoting holy marriage to our children. Because our children in a generation that doesn't want it anymore. I've got a website in my favourites column by CARA, C-A-R-A. 
This is a stats website of the Catholic Church in the United States. And I've studied that, those stats. Not entirely, there's too many to, to look at. But one stat among a few I know very well. In 1971, when there were 50 million Catholics in the United States, the number of marriages in Catholic churches stood at about 425,000. 50 years later, in 2021, with the Catholic population at just over 70 million, and in brackets, 30 million ex-Catholics, so the biggest sorry, denomination in the United States is the Catholic Church, though the Catholic Church is not a denomination. It's the nomination, it's the name. It's not a part of the whole, it is the whole. Okay, that's another issue. <clears throat> the next biggest religious or non-religious group are ex-Catholics of 30 million. But in 2021, with a population of 70 million, the number of marriages in Catholic churches was 97,000. That's less than 20% of the number in 1971. Our children do not want holy marriages anymore. If they're getting married, they're getting married, some in the Catholic Church, <clears throat> some in other churches, some in secular institutions, registry offices, on the beach, wherever, and many not at all. They're just shacking up. We used to call it living in sin. Then we called it de facto relationships. Then we called it shacking up. Then we call it something good and mind your own business don't criticize because now we're in the time of isaiah again we call good evil and evil good and that's what's happened so joseph had no desire for fornication prior to marriage you look at a conservative newspaper like the daily telegraph or fox news run by the same bloke and fornication is not an issue. Our culture is completely surrendered to it. Sex before marriage, what's, what's the problem with that? I had this encounter with a young teacher, leader, in Portugal in World Youth Day. We're sitting there having breakfast in one of the hotels, and a group of us, and he was just talking away, and he said, oh, I'll be moving in with my girlfriend next year. Mm. He said it like casual, relaxed, normal. And I said, Shouldn't you do that after you get married? I said, well, what do you mean? Yeah, you, you can't do that stuff until you get married. And he was nice about it, but someone else at the table was really angry that I said that. <laughs> huh? Because it's become normative. Good is evil and evil is good. A belief in fidelity to marriage. St. So Joseph was angry. He felt betrayed. He wanted fidelity. He thought for a bit that Mary was unfaithful. So there's another virtue. We, we need to have this imbibed in us to export it to our children so the next generation faith can continue. He was observant of the law. We need to be observant of church law while at the same time not being rigid and hard and legalistic to be just. He was a just man. And part of his justice was being faithful to the law in a loving, gentle way. And same for us. He had respect for women. He respected Mary's perpetual virginity. That would have been very, very hard. He would have been given the grace to fulfill that. Many years ago, when I was at Punch Bar Boys as a student, and I was, you know, one of my best friends was a Baptist. And he was the one who took me to the Billy Graham crusade in May 1979 that kicked off my more deliberate, conscious Christian life. And he would say to me in the years that followed, I mean, it's not, do you really believe that St. Joseph, the Virgin Mary, didn't have sex afterwards? Come on, they're a normal married couple. That's what he said. That's the belief of the Baptists, all right? Okay. But he respected, we believe dogmatically, because it's a dogma that Mary is a perpetual virgin. He respected her and he corresponded to the grace that he was given by God to show that respect, to live out that respect. St. Joseph was responsive and obedient to the divine will. Take Mary as your wife. 
That's what the angel said. People said, no, man, what are you, are you for real? Like, this is, this is too much. I can't handle this. He could have walked out, but he didn't. Willing to sacrifice and suffer for the Holy Family, the flight to Egypt. He was humble and quiet. Okay, we said there's not a word recorded in Scripture from St. Joseph. He would have said many things every day uh, as a good husband and father leader of the Holy Family would have done. But what we can gather implicitly is he was a humble man, honest and hard working, mastered a trade, passed that on to Jesus. Sometimes think about that with a bit of humour. Jesus didn't know, didn't need to learn how to make tables. He was the word of God through whom God the Father created the entire universe. Right? He's a divine person in human form now. But he learned, St. Joseph taught him and Jesus submitted to being taught something he already knew. Because right? he would have acted like a, a, a obedient, respectful child to his foster father. Had one priest struggle with the idea with me, he said, this is junk theology of the 60s, 70s and 80s that was out there and still out there held by some Jesus. Yeah, Jesus was God, but he didn't know he was God. You know that? And he said, you're telling me that when Jesus is two years or one years of age or eight months and he's crawling on the ground that he was God? Yeah, I do believe that. Because he's one person. He's a divine person. He's God in human form. How can you be God and not know that you're God? This is ultra junk theology. And it permeated so much of our church today. Uh, so just be warned, if you ever hear people say Jesus didn't know he was God, I would say, sorry, sir, you don't know, you don't know Jesus. It's as simple as that. You don't have any Christology, nothing. It's just, uh, just more just nonsense. Okay, where do I get up to? Okay, honest and hard working, prayerful, trusts in God in times of crisis. He models Trust in crisis times. Jesus is missing for three days. You can't get a bigger crisis than that for the Holy Family. And from what we can gather, he kept his wits about him, would have been praying with Our Lady and ultimately remaining calm and rediscovering where Jesus was in the temple. By the way, what was Jesus doing? Why did he walk out on the Holy Family and did that? If that was your child, what would you have done? I mean, our lady said, oh, you know, why have you done this to us? See that your father and I have been searching for you in sorrow. So, you know, that's a normal reaction of parents, right? You would have grabbed him by the ear and said, oh, where have you been, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Jesus was asserting his manhood. He was 12 going on 13. This is when the Jewish boys became men. This is when the responsibility of the father legally ended. This is when the boy is supposed to now be a complete in the now made a son of the commandment. It's like their confirmation. He is now a man. And Jesus is legally showing that. And also showing him his future mission as teacher, because he's found sitting on a chair with the doctors of the law around him. And that is the posture of a formal teacher. Now, under Jewish law, you could not publicly teach or preach until you were 30. And you notice how old was Jesus when he began his public mission? When he was 30. So Jesus knew the law and timed his the beginning of his public mission in accordance with the law of Moses. When, only when he was 30 did he go formally public and consistently public. All right, uh, St. Joseph tells us that we have to be active in the life of the faith. He was active in the life of the Jewish faith. We saw that by, you know, the, observing the law of circumcision and presenting the infant Jesus in the temple. And that's the model for us. I don't know if St. Joseph did this, but this is what we should be doing as fathers and heads of our fam family, defending the church teaching when it is attacked. It's everywhere attacked. Never more ever than today. And you are Adam in your garden. Your home is your garden. 
Adam's big mistake was allowing that serpent not just to be in the garden, but not repelling the serpent. And we have to repel the serpent. We have to watch what's coming into our garden, into our home. It used to be just television and the magazines and, and newspapers, but now it's even more pervasive through the iPhone, through the TikTok and the Instagram and the YouTube and whatever, whatever's out there. It's harder than ever, but I'm sure St. Joseph protected morally his family and we have the same obligation modeled, modeling after him. Uh, St. Joseph was an active defender for Christ. So must we, and we must speak out. You know, people are afraid of the Maronites now. And I see it and I'm aware of it in circles I operate in. Because we've got a bit of clout now. We've been using it in the last few years in different controversies. We've got, and why I say this, because we've got, and this has led in great part by, and I say this with enormous respect, it might sound disrespectful, I'm not intending to be disrespectful at all. It's led by uneducated laymen. Hey, that's great. Because they're baptized, they're confirmed, they receive the Eucharist. They are warriors for God, warriors for Christ. And when people who are supposed to speak out don't, when the Pharisees and the scribes said to Jesus, Tell those children to stop. The children were crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. And the Pharisees said, tell those children to stop. Jesus said, if I tell those children to stop, the rocks will cry out. When people who are supposed to cry out don't cry out, the rocks cry out. And there are a lot of lay men and women who are not formally trained in theology, they don't have power in the church or society, but they're just ordinary people living out their baptism, are doing really effective things now. Um, and it's shaking up certain places. I know, I've seen it, okay? And, we, and this is fantastic. I don't think St. Joseph shook things up, right? But it, it, he certainly dodged a lot of bullets on behalf of the, of the, of the Holy Family. And we, I want to, I'd love to see this continue, to just snowball, to gather momentum. And don't allow ourselves to become too westernised. I was totally westernised. I was born and bred here in Bankstown and Punchbowl when it was completely white Anglo-Saxon working class 60 years ago, when there was hardly any Lebanese here. And if I was spoke a, an Arabic word, if I was seen eating a Lebanese sandwich, when people found out I was Leban Lebanese background, I was dehumanised and called a wog, repeatedly, relentlessly, and abused, and it was terrifying. But these people have died out because they're not faithful. They're white, and I have no racism here, and I don't like this, I don't want this to happen, but the white Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples around the world and in Australia are disappearing. They're dying because of infidelity. They're not living like St. Joseph lived, faithful to God. Faithful to family, faithful to truth. All they want, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, what are they? Abortion, contraception, divorce, euthanasia, gay, homosexual, lesbianism, euthanasia. That's what they want. And they're dying now. And we, we can't become, it like, we can't be like that. We can't allow ourselves to become like that. We hold on to our Middle Eastern, Maronite, Eastern traditions and that's the way forward. And that's why we're growing. That's why we have uh, full churches. And our churches aren't emptying, like sadly churches in the Western world are. All right, nearly finished. Where am I up to? All right. Uh, yeah. Be a watchful and active defender for Christ. As I said, look after your garden. Be that Adam, Adam should have been in his garden. Get, in, get involved, 
and this I'm pausing here because what I'm about to say is very controversial. Raise your children in the faith and do not give your children or money to any corrupt system or organisation. When people say, where should I send my children to be educated? I give them options. But one thing you do not do, don't, what, what our revolutionary culture wants you to do is to give your children and your money to them. Don't. You've got very good options in Catholic education. There are, some, there are a number of schools I'm aware of which are very good that I would recommend. But the Maronite schools I would strongly recommend. Opus Day schools I would strongly recommend. <coughs> Homeschooling I would certainly recommend if you're up to it. Though Lebanese Maronites generally shy away from that. But as a defender of your family, and the raising of your family in the faith, don't give your children or your money to any organisation, persons, whatever, that will corrupt your children. And campaign and vote against those who threaten the church or our freedom of religion, and that's happening now. Our federal government wants to take away our legal protections under Section 38 of the Sex Discrimination Act and force us in our churches and our schools to hire people who do not share our faith, our values, our lifestyles. And that's where we, what we've got, what power we've got with the vote, with our voice, with our finances, whatever, to put pressure to fight back on this. All right, I've strayed a little bit off St. Joseph, but I think I've, I've still said relevant things. All who love family in these great times very grave times, should look at St. Joseph as the model. And as St. Teresa of Avila said back in the 16th century, go to Joseph, go to Joseph in prayer, seek his intercession for yourself, your leadership, your love, your family, your children, and your church. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you and God bless. Taking any questions? Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, did the Pharisees know? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know St. Joseph was a king until you said it now. Did the Pharisees know that? No. When they said, wow, our Messiah is a son of a carpenter, did they know it? Our, our Messiah sorry. is a son of who? How can, how can someone, the son of a carpenter, yeah. be our king, our Messiah? That's right. Like they, they, they looked at it like, you know. That's right. Like, did they know that St. Joseph was a king? No. And they were just lying? No, they did not they know. And I wouldn't say they're lying. They were incredulous. They could not believe it. Uh, the prophecies did say that he was to come out of Bethlehem, the, the town of David. But what do they call Jesus as an insult? The Nazarene. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Read the, read the scriptures. No prophets come out of Nazareth. Uh, St. Joseph was royalty. The Holy Family were royalty. There's this famous video going out on TikTok and Instagram of this American basketball coach. Last year, he was interviewed and he said, did you, did you see the royal family? He said, who are you talking about? Oh. Um, you know, um, uh, what's it, Catherine and William. They were there for the big NBA game in America in this stadium. And the, and the coach said, oh, no, no, I only know one royal family. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The, the person who asked the question began to giggle, but it's true. He's obviously a Catholic and a good Catholic. The, the, the Holy Family, royal, royal family of the house of David. Jesus is a king, the ultimate king in the house of David. House of David was established in the fight, really. God did not want Israel to have kings. He knew what would happen. And it happened. Most of the kings of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel were corrupt, were immoral, were scandalous, were perverse, right? But God took the greatest good out of that from the house of David, the Messiah, the ultimate king in that line. Joseph, he didn't look like anyone special, neither did the Virgin Mary. But this was perhaps God's, it was certainly God's plan to be that way. So they would not stand out and be distinct. Okay, and then perhaps targeted as a consequence as Herod wanted to destroy them when he heard about a newborn king, etc. So they kept, they had that 
this guys in inverted commas they lay low and they did not look like anything special at all so jesus was uneducated they said how does this man know this that when they found him in the temple there he is 12 13 years of age uh, and they're amazed at this at this young boy's intelligence his knowledge and the questions he asks and the answers that he gives how did he know this he never was educated. He never went to a rabbinical school. Only about 10% of boys went to rabbinical schools. Girls did not go to formal schools. And only 1% of boys were trained to be rabbis. And Jesus didn't go to any school. He was a zero. He was a total nobody. And Joseph was a zero, a total nobody in the eyes of the world and the establishment and the powers. Okay? But he what? That's why you have to have the. That's why Matthew and Luke, the, the genealogies are very important. They're there for apologetical, apologetical purposes to show that he was of the house of David, to show that he was also of the seed of Abraham, okay, and to show that he goes right back in lineage to the first son of God. This is Luke. Jesus, the son of God, ends with Adam, son of God. He's the new Adam. He's the expected one of this. Of the seed of Abraham and he's of the house of David that's why the genealogies are there to you know as authenticity to give authenticity to the claims that Jesus was of the you know the, the Davidic line and therefore legitimate as the Messiah okay they didn't just I mean Jesus if he came today I would certainly want proof of his credentials an uneducated nobody from the north, someone in robes with long hair looking like a hippie. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, I'm not going to just believe in him straight away. That we, ha we had to establish his credentials. That's one reason why he did miracles. Okay? And then we have to go beyond that with other forms of evidence. That's why when the gospel writers are writing what they wrote, they're pulling prophecies out of the Old Testament and showing how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Matthew takes 60 prophecies out of, uh, of the Old Testament shows, show, to show how they're fulfilled by Jesus of Nazareth because he's writing to a Hebrew audience. Okay? Um, so to answer your question, no, they did not know he was a king. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. If in uh, Mary's child bearing pain, would you link that to the moment, or what was the need for the Bible to mention it, unless she was still sinless? Yeah. Well, Isaiah mentions it, among many other prophecies relating to the Messiah. Genesis. Um, well, Genesis. What's in Genesis three fifteen? You know. Um, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall crush your head. That's the first, that's the first gospel. Even before they're expelled from the garden, which happens seven verses later, 322, Genesis 322. But in Isaiah itself, um, yeah, um, Isaiah was a prophet of doom, you know, in the time of Israel's destruction and the, uh, uh, the assault of Assyria upon Judah and Judah saved because Hezekiah listened to Isaiah. But he's also the chosen instrument to give us many prophecies about uh, the, the people of God, their future hope, and, and that would be the Messiah. And one aspect of the Messiah's coming that his birth would be miraculous. Okay, and it does relate, and we see it in hindsight. You can't see it at the time necessarily. Right? If, the, if it was that easy to see at the time, then the Jews would have accepted uh, Jesus as the Messiah. But they're looking at scriptures and they're expecting a Messiah that's going to be worldly, political, powerful, militaristic, son of David, coming on a white horse with armies, golden crown, driving out the Romans, re-establishing the visible kingdom of David and Solomon from the Nile to the Euphrates. Tell me which of those boxes did Jesus tick? None. Okay, but you know, in hindsight, we look at these prophecies, we look at the life of Jesus, and we look at the prophecies, and we see how those prophecies were fulfilled. And I'm not surprised, and I'm delighted to see that there's a prophecy relating to the miraculous birth of Jesus, and that supports the dogma of Mary's perpetual virginity. Okay, conceived by you know, a, a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, that relates to her perpetual virginity. And she gives birth to a male child before she suffers any labor pains. They both come together. Virgin birth, miraculous birth. Okay.
Looks like that's it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for coming. God bless. Thank you. Um,